plenary. Um, so while everybody else settles down, I've spotted my our keynote speaker, so that's fine. So good afternoon. Let's um, make a start. Um, we have one keynote um, speech um, starting in a, in a second before we get into the closing formalities of um, Apricot 2016. So first off, I would like to inv invite Jeff Houston up on the stage to talk about BGP for 2015. Hi, Philip, and uh, thank you. It's certainly an honour and a, a change to do both the opening and closing keynotes, but uh, I'll see what I can do to make it a little bit interesting. Um, this is actually looking at the routing system across the last 13 months or so and trying to sort of divine from there what the internet looks like because when you sit there in your little corner of the internet, it's like sitting down there on a street corner trying to figure out what Auckland looks like. And you can see a few blocks here and a few blocks there and maybe down a street but it's very, very hard to see all of Auckland from a street corner. And with the internet, there's no helicopter view. You can't rise out of the internet and look at all of it everywhere. It just doesn't work like that. So every view is relative, with perhaps one exception, and that's the routing system. Because the job of the routing system is to actually describe a huge amount of the topology to your router, you, then and there. So the routing system actually brings the entire internet to you. Now, the issue is, it's a fractured lens. And, you know, let's get, get that through straight away. It's not a very good roadmap. It's a biased roadmap. There are a number of reasons why. Um, the first thing is, none of us know what the internet, in terms of routing, really is. You know, yes, I do. I use it all the time. How many routes do you need to say that you can reach everywhere? How much address reachability is required to say that you can reach everywhere? Because when you look at the internet, I'll go this one from forward. This is a view from route views of every single peer. It's not one line. Every peer has a subtly different view of the internet. Who's right? Some folk have less routes than other folk. And even when you take a different view, which isn't on this slide, to say, which addresses can you reach? The addresses that you can reach from your provider are different to the span of addresses that you can reach from yours. You can reach a few, but you can't reach and vice versa. None of us seem to think this is unusual or bad. It's weird. There's no external definition of what the internet is. And so when we look at this kind of view of the internet, the first thing is the lens is fractured. There's no routing god. There's no someone from above to say, that's the internet, and those extra routes, they're bogus. We have no idea. What is the internet is merely a convention, a vote. And BGP just spreads it round. But what it spreads round is reachability of addresses. So the next kind of question, since we've spent the entire week talking about it, is what's an address? What's an IP address? Now, if you'd asked me that question, 20 years ago, let's go all the way, 30. I'd say it was a lot like a phone number. Doesn't change, it's me. And whenever you send a packet to that particular address, whatever it may have been 30 years ago, and I've completely forgotten, 130156 dot something or other. I'm sad I even remember that. When you send a packet to that address, it always got to my Christ, was it Sun Workstation or Vax Workstation or something? It got to me. Today, what's an address? 
If you pull out your mobile phone and have a look at the address that it describes in V4, it starts with 10, doesn't it? They all do. Everyone shares. We're all on NATs. The population of the NATed internet is minimally 10 billion wide and probably a lot bigger. So what's an address? You could say it's an entry into a map binding table. It doesn't identify endpoints anymore. You could say it's just an ephemeral conversation token that when I've stopped using it, you can use it too. And in fact, I'll take port 80, you can take port 81. And that's all an address is. So these days, oddly enough, we're busy saying, go use V6, it has all these extra addresses and we need addresses. At the same time, when you've confronted scarcity, you've produced technology, architecture and service that says, I can cope with scarcity. I'll go and invade the port number field. I'll go and put basically intelligence in the network to create dynamic state to share the addresses better. And it's actually an open question where we're going with this, because we're really, really good and stuffing computing and capability and state into our networks. There's a few folk going, and I can see them now, ah, you have lost the old end-to-end -end transparency. Yes, things had to break. And it's kind of difficult to argue with reality, this is the network of today. There were better decisions we could have made. We could have done V6 years ago. We didn't. We got awfully inventive in the way networks work. And these days, addresses aren't what addresses were. So when I look at the routing system and addresses, I know that the lens I'm using is deeply fractured and flawed and a bit cloudy. I don't get to see an awful lot. Of those 12, 15, 20 billion things out there, I see their ghosts as they walk through, borrow an address from a gnat, flitter their way and then just give it back. So no God, no stable network, no default. Why are we bothering? Because it's fun because there's a whole lot to see. And this one, I'll, I'll get back to it again. Not only is every path different, but our history is written there. This is the internet from 1994. Um, because at the time, and it seems really weird to think about it, but we were really, really worried that we're all going to die a routing heat death when the number of uh, addresses, the number of objects in the routing system exceeded that magic number of 20,000. Something about the IBM XTs couldn't take it anymore, or warp speed or something. But there was this gigantic black wall of, oh my god, what are we going to do? And indeed, what we did do is change the addressing architecture of the time. And that little sort of blip and correction, yes, you'll need a magnifying glass, it is tiny, actually saved our bacon at the time. Silicon came along and all got better, but yes, that was the first sort of major event. Um, some of us lived through the boom and bust of the year 2000, you know, the great internet bubble. Cisco shares hit 50 billion gazillion dollars and then they plummeted again, you know. And you can actually see it in the routing system where the euphoria of that initial build just disappeared. And for a couple of years we were wading through the sort of accumulated garbage of bankrupt companies and trying to get rid of all the venture capital and find the underlying business. Not unusual. In Britain, the great railway boom turned into the great railway bust, and then they went through the ashes of all those old railway companies, and by 1850 again, or 1855, they had a decent railway system once more. And that's sort of what we did. Because once we got rid of that first wave of entrepreneurial capital, and actually started doing massive deployment, particularly starting with DSL, and then moving beyond that, you start to see that incredible build out that oddly enough did sustain at the time exponential growth. Now, exponential growth, if you've ever worked in large companies, is a nightmare. Because you're moving capital, you're moving process, you're moving people, and each year it's not enough. Because not only is it going to be the same next year, but it's going to be more. So you're continually hungry for more capital, more people, and if you're a telephone company, particularly, more process, because you can never have enough process. So you sort of saw through the 90s and early 2000s this astonishing explosion of this growth. And interestingly, while it seemed at the time the great financial crisis of 2009 certainly hammered away at many markets, the internet only took a slight hit. 
growth slowly tempered, and then we're back in again. That even address exhaustion didn't stop the V4 network from expanding in the routing space. This kind of growth that we're seeing seemed to have a life of its own. So that's an astonishing story that, to my mind, even defies the normal laws of physics. You know, address exhaustion should have had an impact. For some reason, it didn't. So, you know, let's just pull that final year out and just look at last year. No one knows which is right. I think the guy at the top is inventing, and I think the girl at the bottom, or whatever, you know, whichever way you want to look at it, is a bit of invention either way. Some of them are missing, some of them have too many. But, you know, of the rest, there are places you can't get to. You don't know what they are, but there's an ICMP message train, if you try and get to everywhere, that'll tell you where you can't get to where you can. Because there is a certain asymmetry in connectivity. It's not all just traffic engineering prefixes. And everyone sees a subtly different internet that that slide actually shows there. There's no agreement on what the internet is. It's just a collection of routes. Last year was kind of funny. We started off optimistic. And then we slowed down again because, you know, we ran out of puff by about March. Um, two very definite growth trends. I'm not sure why that happened, but the annual growth rate, maybe it was, when did the oil price really collapse? Could have been, who knows. Capital, when capital takes flight, and we are a capital market, uh, growth rate stall. And it could well be the great fibre rollout, the great this or the great that, kind of took a second go and said, oh no, we'll wait for a while. But there is a certain amount of waiting for a while. Um, I said this earlier uh, in the address policy SIG, but the routing indicators certainly say, though, that the one thing that we were really, really scared about all the way back then in 1994 was the fact that routing is an unconstrained system. You can put as many routes as you want in the routing system, no one will stop you, and there's no incremental cost. You don't pay a cent. So if you want to put all your unused addresses into the routing system, Victimless crime, or so it appears. So the only difference between where we are now, near 600,000 routes, and 600 million routes, is our common constraint. We could all advertise slash 32s. You could try. But the community together says that's a really, really dumb idea. And that common constraint is actually what has bounded this growth. And if you look over the last few years, it's no longer exponential. It's almost like a train. 47,000 new prefixes per year. Common constraint. And I find that a bit remarkable. No one's telling you what to do. That's what you do. And if you look at the other one too, which is the number of new autonomous system numbers, um, they're used far more densely in, in North America and in Europe, almost as a ratio of 10 to 1 between APNIC and... Uh, Aaron and Wright, but the rate at which they hit the routing system, really constant, 3,100 ASs a year. I don't know why, I don't know how, but you know, it doesn't even stop for Christmas. It's just a slow, steady growth of the number of distinct ASs in the routing system. Fascinating. Um, more specifics. You keep on going to Philip's stuff, and Philip says, don't de-aggregate, don't, don't do this. It's just routing vandalism. You listen half the time, and you've listened for half the time for 20 odd years. The routing system, 50% of it is more specifics of aggregates. Hasn't changed. And I suppose what Philip does is make sure it stays at half. It never gets higher, never gets lower. More specifics take up one half of the routing table. It's one of those unwritten constants. And almost the only place where address exhaustion is obvious is in the average size of a routing entry, that line at the bottom. Because now, around 4,500 addresses per average routing entry, which is a, God, slash 20, slash 21? Yeah, 20, something like that. You know, I know, really. Um, we started much higher. Um, back in 2010, 7,000. Went out down to 4,000 addresses per routing entry and falling. So in some ways, the granularity of the routing system is getting finer. As you deploy more NATs, particularly carrier-grade NATs, more and more folk crowd behind each routing entry. 
kind of expected, really. It's nothing new. Um, the total address span announced is the other place. There is no more addresses. So for the last few years, we've been unable to add many more addresses into the routing system. So what we actually see is if you count up all the addresses that most of you advertise, there's no truth, it's just one truth, you know, there's just one view, it's tapering off. We can't keep on growing because you're reaching the limit of V4 address space. And the other thing too is that none of you like living on the edge. Now I say this in New Zealand and you are on an edge, right? The most isolated island in the world probably, who knows, it seems like a long way to get here even from Australia. Um, but you hate to connect in the edge. The average inter-AS distance, and that big hop is me, I sort of collected a few more routes, but it's really constant. If you're going to connect, you try as much as you can to connect close to a tier one. So everyone crams into the middle and none of you go to the edge. There's a really, really good side effect from that, which we'll see in a few more slides, but the shape of the internet is such that everyone keeps on saying, I want to be close to the middle, I don't want to hang off you. No one likes being a customer. You always want to drive your network closer in, and that's a good thing. So, I think I've said all of this, we're up to 600,000. If your TCAM only has 512,000 entries, you've been toast for a year. It's not news now, your router's dead. Go buy a bigger one. Um, the pace of the growth, relatively steady, around 50,000 a year. And of course, now what's going on is we're recycling. We're transferring addresses because you can't get them from APNIC anymore unless you're into that, you know, slash 20 here, sl sorry, slash 22 here, slash 22 there. Most of them are in the transfer logs. Some of them aren't. Kind of interesting to see. How can we see that in the numbers? This is kind of an interesting one. I've taken January to December. Two pictures of the routing system. They cover two spans of addresses, and then I slap them together and say, what's the diff? These addresses were different. These are the ones that got added. And then I go back to the registry saying, when did they leave the registry? When were they allocated? So all of the new addresses that appeared in 2010, 80% of them have been given out by APNIC, Aaron, RIPE, etc. They've been given out in 2010. You got an address, you routed an address. And for about 20% of addresses, you mined some history. But all the stuff is recent. Allocation policies became routing policies, right? That was then. This is now. What's happening is that we can't give you new addresses. But the routing table's still growing. And oddly enough, there are more addresses appearing. But a bit like coal, you're mining your history. And that now 33% of all those new addresses that got announced in 2015 were allocated more than 20 years ago. Allocation policy, for what it's worth, in a day of exhaustion, doesn't actually affect routing anymore because the two aren't combined. So 20% of all new addresses announced in 2015 were allocated and assigned in the last 12 months, basically Afrinic and Aaron before they exhausted, and everyone else is mining history. We're mining recent history, and as you see from the years as they progressed, we started to look further and further back, and now one third of all those new addresses are now 20 years old. So what's driving the growth? Transfers, last slash eight policies, leasing and address recovery. Let's just look at this again and try a different view. The blue line is all the addresses out there that the RIRs gave out. The green line is all the addresses in the routing system. That red line is all the addresses that are out there that we can't see in routing. Now what's interesting is that address exhaustion started to bite in 2010, when we had approximately 50 slash eights or the equivalent unadvertised. And it's hardly moved. 10 bucks an address hasn't flushed it out. Maybe we need 11, maybe 12, I don't know. But the red line isn't declining rapidly. There might be demand, but that's not flushing out all these unadvertised addresses. That's a blow up of just this year. And there's something really weird about that. Because you kind of expect, because we're mining our history, that that pool would decline. 
But sometime around November, someone said, oh, I'm not using these addresses, I'm going to withdraw them from the routing system. Completely unexpected. I have no idea, well, actually I do, but, you know, I'm not going to tell you who it was, but you know you can see what's going on, that we were mining our history and then we decided not to. We decided to bank some back in, and sort of withdraw the addresses from the advertised routing system. Interesting. Here's another way of looking at it by zeroing out on the 1st of January. So the blue line is what's getting advertised and that's going up and to the right. The green line is what's actually leaving the registries as allocations and the red line is filling in the difference. It's a sort of as we use, if you will, the unadvertised addresses as a piggy bank. We draw from it, and at the end of the year, we started giving some back. That's rather bizarre. But let me invert the thing and say, how good are we at recovery? So for a while, allocation and recovery transfers were kind of tracking. We were doing the same rate of allocations as transferring stuff and bringing it back in, and just near the end of the year we said, oh, this recovery stuff is too hard, let's drop some back into the unadvertised pool. Strange behaviour, certainly un unanticipated. So, four slash eights were assigned and allocated, 2.3 2 from Aaron, one, one slash eight from Afrinic, and three slash eights were recovered, and then we banked two of them back in the piggy bank. Don't know why. That was kind of the summary of what happened. V6 is a different story. V6 is a very, very different story. We still see this phenomenal piecemeal uptake of V6, and the map that I haven't shown is where is V6. If you take the 30 largest ISPs on the planet, and I don't mean by number, sorry India, what I mean is when I multiply the number of customers by the GDP per capita of the country, there are rich countries with high GDP per capita. There are countries with lower GDP per capita. But if you find those ISPs servicing the richest parts of the world, 90% of all the V6 customers come from the top 30 of those ISPs, just six of them. So what's going on is there are small pockets of really intense deployment of V6. Comcast, AT&T, Verizon. Uh, Time Warner Cable, or is it Charter now or something, is now moving. American companies. Uh, Kabel Deutschland and Deutsche Telekom in Germany. Complete rollout. Absolutely massive. And those sort of, those economies dominate. The UK, well, might happen next year, but it's not happening now. France, steady. So a small number of folk are moving, but the rest are kind of watching, going, still waiting. Now, if you look at the routing system, you don't see that. That's still a strong kind of growth. Uh, World V6 day, V4 exhaustion, minor blips in a, in a story. Look at the variance, though. Again, we just don't know what is the V6 internet. And some folks see a lot more routes than others. The 2015 story, again, this kind of band that you see more routes than you see, and it actually means different addresses as well. Default differs. There are places you can't get to. It's just what happens in V6. Um, again, there's someone, there's someone right down the bottom seeing half the number of routes that everyone else. Guys, get it together. We know who you are. I can tell you later. Uh, no one in this room. Um, routing prefixes, V4 growing by about 50,000 a year, V6 growing by about 6,000 a year. Uh, AS numbers, 3,000 in V4, about 1,600 in V6. Slight tip up at the edge of the year, but you know, typically around half the size of growth. Um, we always thought you know, that V6 would get real when it was polluted the same way as V4, and you're getting there. Around about one third of, of that space is more specifics. And interestingly, and I still find this a little bit weird, all this address space, the average size of advertisements is getting smaller, not larger. Don't know why. Maybe it is just traffic engineering, but it is getting smaller. Um, the address span, linear, not exponential. You're never, ever going to overtake V4 unless that changes. Never, ever, ever. And that's really, really bad news. Something needs to change to that number. Interestingly, though, you always like the middle. The AS interconnectivity, you're not getting stringier, you're not getting more compact, you're kind of mirroring the same thing about V4. You want a cluster but not too, too tightly, not too intimate. 
So it's not that there's a single network in the centre. There's still a cluster of tier ones in V6, same as V4, and we all sort of grow around it to just a limit of diameter. So the summary, you can read it as well as I can. It's about one-seventh of the growth rate of the V4 network, and the AS growth rate's about one-half. So part of this is where's it going? And, you know, normally when you do these kind of projections, yesterday is tomorrow, yes? Slight changes, but, you know, it's just apply the differences. So you take the growth rates. This is the difference, the daily growth rate of V4. You apply some model across it. That's not a bad model. We appear to be doing 150 new advertisements per day. Um, if you take the relative growth rate in percentage, though, what you actually find is as we get bigger, the relative growth rate gets smaller. This looks linear. This looks really, really, really linear. And so if it's really, really, really linear, that's the projection. So if you're running a, mega, uh, a million entries in your TCAM for V4, a million entries, you shouldn't panic until around 2021. So from this respect, this table really hasn't got a problem. If you really, really need to run V4 in five years' time, we have failed. Collectively, we've all failed. <coughs> because of five years of pumping a minimum of one and a half billion extra devices into the network is going to make the pressure on carrier grade NATs extreme. So if we are at that point, something else is badly, badly, badly broken. So in terms of a projection, the numbers are fine. In terms of the reality of the describing, that reality is a dystopia of, of gigantic proportion. It should be zero at that point. It's not. Or if it's not, we will have failed. Let's apply the same thing to V6. Will it ever overtake? Will it grow? The problem is that it's really hard to see strong exponential patterns. The daily growth rate is around 15 entries per day, and that increase is really slow. If it was exponential, that should be a lot, lot higher. It's not. The relative growth rates, if it's exponential, should be steady or climbing. Relative growth rate is, de is declining. That's bad. So we're not growing quickly, we're growing at almost a linear pace. That kind of says it. So the projection says, even if I'm charitable and say, look, sometime we'll start massively doubling our effort in V6, the current numbers say that in five years' time you'll span 127,000 entries, less than a quarter of the internet of today. Doesn't work. And we're looking more linear than exponential. And at the linear rate, the V6 network is still a toy. So again, those figures shouldn't give you cause for confidence. There's something more deeply fractured in the internet. And quite frankly, these numbers are unsustainable for both V4 and V6. They're too big for V4 and they go too far. For V6, they're just too small and not growing fast enough. So if you're worried about your TCAM, Forget it. On the current rates, your TCAM's just fine. It shouldn't be, but it's just fine. Um, the overall growth model is OK. Nothing's melting. Um, the other thing you should worry about is your CPU, because your CPU in, in your router is really important. The update load in BGP. Um, whenever I look at this slide, I always think that there is a god, and it's a miracle. That's the size of the routing table in Orange since 2007. The blue is the total number of updates, which is basically the load imposed on your CPU every single day since then. And if you look at that trend line, it is bizarre that the network tripled in size and the update rate remained constant. And then in 2013, there was a slight state change. Flip. Then it went constant again. Whatever you're doing, and I don't know what you're doing, and I suspect you don't either, don't stop. Right, because what you're doing is brilliant. Because here's this massively growing system running a distance vector protocol. And we all know distance vector routing protocols suck like crazy. And the worst thing you can do to a distance vector protocol is add more entities. Because a distance vector protocol basically finds a stable point by this phenomenal chat rate. More people, more updates, more mayhem. You are defying physics. You were defying all that we knew about routing somehow. And it's brilliant, because your routers still work and consume the same CPU, basically, as they were consuming almost 10 years ago. 
This is amazing. Shouldn't have happened. How fast does it take to converge a route that flaps? Well, it takes 40 seconds. It did 10 years ago and does now. Again, this should never happen. So what you're seeing is some kind of miracle of routing. There's even a slight knee there where we saw the other knee. But again, there's no reason for this to have happened. I suspect that because you all like to cluster into the middle, that's the reason why we're able to contain this. If you all decide it's really cool to build long stringy networks, you'll have a lousy routing system. But because you like to cluster, updates are really fast because the diameter of the network is still much the same. So you could describe this as a neutron star in formation. What's actually going on is as we pump more material in, the diameter remains the same. It just gets denser. And that gives you that convergence performance outcome. So that's really cool. Again, no cause for concern. No need to buy some phenomenal amount of computing performance to do routing, because it's working unbelievably. Uh, V6, you know, something happened in December. <laughs> And I don't know what, but something happened in V6 that's never happened in V4, and you, you went and tipped over some, some horizon point. You're into a new world, a new world of a nightmare where a tiny network is generating a massive number of updates. We know who they are. We'll give you the list later. Um, <laughs> convergence performance, a bit rattier. And again, I suspect that part of this is tunnels, and the residual use of tunnel V6 over V4 that drives some of this outwards and upwards, but it's still pretty crappy performance. Underlying it is much the same infrastructure, and those folk who do 6 and 4 do it across much the same systems. So is it the routers that are pushing V6 through slow paths? Is it that your TCAMs are doing 4 and not 6? What's going on here that gives you such a dramatically different performance and the convergence of V6 routes. And it is dramatic that instability in V6 is phenomenally bad by comparison to 4. Um, the updated prefixes per day is growing ever so slightly, but it's still OK. But there's this, again, there's updates per event. That something happened in the last few months, and it's happened before, but in the last few months it sort of went absolutely crazy. So V6 is less stable. And again, I have no reason. I have no reason why V4 is stable, and that's what's saving you, and I have no real reason why V6 is so much less stable. So it's not the number of unstable prefixes, it's not any of those things, but I tell you what, if whatever we did in V6, you do unconsciously in V4, you're toast. You're just fried. You won't survive. Because if 600,000 entries behave like these 16 or 20,000 entries in six, your routers will melt through the bottom of the floor. They just won't cope. So, you know, it's a really good question, what the hell happened? And how can we prevent it happening in four? And if you're really good and you have the stretch goal, how can we stop it happening in six? Because if you think six is your future, there's something to fix here. And I don't quite know what it is, and neither do you, because you're doing it. Um, so I said a few folk were incredibly noisy. Um, and it is the case that the top 1% of prefixes cause 80% of all the updates. So it's not that everyone's noisy. It's just the few folk that are noisy drown out everything else. Here they are. Web Africa gets the uh, top. Thank you, Elaine. Um, yes, Web Africa. Um, I noticed the IETF meeting, <laughs> meeting V6 network is in there as well, flapping like crazy. And if you see yourself there, including our folk in RIPE, there are probably reasons for why you're in this list of shame, uh, but you are in the list of shame. And that what we're seeing here is that this updates, this phenomenal load that's being impressed in V6 in terms of you know, the sheer instability that's draining out the routers, actually comes from the busiest 48 prefixes, and this is the top 20 of those 48, account for two-thirds of all that traffic. So there's something skewed here. Whatever these folk are doing, if they just bloody stopped, we'd all be fine. Route filter, whatever you want to do, right? If you get rid of these people, the rest of the network will actually go quiet. So there's something here about the way routing works, which we're still under trying to understand. That to that extent, 
this system that we've built, we only dimly understand its dynamic properties. And we have been in V4 and continue to be phenomenally fortunate that the gods of routing have smiled on us. And the behaviours we collectively impose upon ourselves so far have preserved a system that's tractable and routable. And fascinatingly, what we're doing in six isn't giving us that same assurance. And so maybe we need to spend more time and think about how we do routing and think about what's going on in the V6 network because things do need to change. So yes, the lens is fractured. Yes, addresses are changing in terms of their semantics. Yes, there's all this stuff hidden behind NATs. But nevertheless, there's a constant here that the network needs to be glued together. Ultimately, for it to be of value, everyone needs to see everybody else. And the only way we know how to do that is with a common routing system. And that's the thing that we need to look after and tend to make sure it's still working tomorrow and tomorrow and the day after that too. Thank you very much. Does this work? Yes. Um, so are there any questions for Jeff at all? I see folks running to the mic. If you can say name affiliation, please, for the webcast. For, for the record, I didn't run. Um, Martin Levy Cloudflare. Could you go back, please, about four or five slides to show the comparison of V4 and V6? Keep going. I never gave you a comparison, I just gave you different slides. No, you, sorry, I apologize. A, two tables showing V4 and V6 um, going into 2020 something or other. It's back a few slides. There. Well, no, speak no, backwards as no, well. No, forward, <laughs> forward. Sorry, gone too far. That one back. Perfect. If you were to compare that V6 page and the one a few back, oh, there, would it be possible to remove the traffic engineering announcements in the V4 world to get a more reasonable number? And then on the V6 side, say, hypothetically, and I think I'm pretty close on this statement, very little traffic engineering is being done at the moment, and see more similarity between them. I draw your attention to the top graph, which charts the more specifics in V6. And while it was true back in 2010, that there were very few more specifics in V6, that has you've changed. done very well, and you get the prize, you're now up to 30%. Uh -huh. So if I take the traffic engineering out of four, I've got to take it out of six as well now. Okay, I'm okay with the that. The sins we're committing in one are being recommitted in the other. But doesn't this make them slightly closer? In, Ever so. In, 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 in damage and failure. Ever so slightly, Martin, but a lot more needs to be done in six if we're ever going to make any difference to the world in terms of its V6 update. Yeah, These I... numbers alone, even with traffic engineering, won't get you there. I'm sorry. Okay. I accept that. More effort required. I will walk away from the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Dean Pemberton, Internet NZ. For the record, I didn't run either. Um, <laughs> no one found that surprising. Um, you say... You say a lot that whenever we go through these step changes that, you know, that you, we don't know why, so that the data doesn't, need, you know, doesn't, doesn't specifically show us why. Is, my question is, is, is that just because we haven't actually you know, looked and, and analysed this, or is there actually missing data here that if we go out and collect that we could get more insight, or is what we're saying it's actually in people's heads as to why, and we're, and we're never going to know. I don't think it has enough research. Right. Are these instabilities hole-punching, traffic engineering, battles between two folk doing more specifics, med problems? Cool. You know, we don't understand 
why things are unstable, and why they damp down to that level, and it is a research question. Cool. So, yeah, that's what I was trying to establish, is, is this an opportunity for more research, or are we going into what is in this provider's head? It is an opportunity for more research. Okay. Cool. These days, if you can ever put the word cyber security into your research proposal, it's no matter deal, what right? you want to study, yeah. it'll be done. Yeah. So if you think there's a cyber security behind that graph, you can study it and research and people will just walk over themselves to give you money. That looks like terrorism to me. That I'm looks like terrorism to me too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think you're getting another question, Jeff. Oh, <laughs> so nobody's running anywhere at all. So you can have my mic. Then. I was running away from terrorism. <laughs> Donald Neal, Vocus this week. Um, it's not hard to imagine a large service provider which has a long list of V4 advertisements because it's got the prefixes it was allocated and the prefixes that the companies it took over were allocated and they're all discontinuous. And it has got a tiny fraction of that number uh, of V6 prefixes advertised because they're a hell of a lot bigger for a start. If you measure not number of prefixes advertised, but number of ASs doing the advertising, does the pattern come out different? So, um, I, I pointed out that there are 3,100 new ASs per year entering the V4 routing system, and there are 1,600 ASs per year entering the V6 routing system. So, you'd think, oh, that's half the number of entrants, but the density of ASs that folk tend to use their own AS is much higher in the Ripe and Aran regions than in the region we serve. That when we do networking here, we tend to be non-AS delineated customers of other folk, whereas other folk, you tend to get your own AS and assert independence. So while it looks like half, I don't think that's the full picture. I think because there's different uses and semantics of ASs in these regions, simply saying, well, it's half the growth, that's a real problem, is not quite the full story. It masks some other data. And if you want to research that, that's probably terrorist too. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. I probably don't need to come back up, up here anyway. So, yes, so this brings us to the um, closing formalities of um, Apricot 2016. So, um, well, I'm Philip Smith. I'm your master of ceremonies. I'm unaccustomed to this role, so I don't know. I think Jordan started something with the opening plenary being MC there. So I'll be MC for, for this. Um, let me see who we got first. So. Um, I'm going to invite um, Jordan to say a few words on behalf of Internet New Zealand, our host, if you would like to say something to the assembly. To the assembly, I suddenly felt like I might be back at high school and had a wave of horror pour through my mind. Um, look, just really quickly to say thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you had a nice time in Auckland. We managed to make sure the sun stayed out for you. Um, we got you some fresh air yesterday with the fire alarm, which I hope got you all to stretch your legs at an appropriate point. Um, but the vibe that I've picked up and my team have picked up is that it's been a, a, a good event, um, that things have mostly worked once we fixed the wireless, um, and that we've been really pleased to have you here, and we hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Um, while I'm on here, I'd like to thank my staff team who uh, worked with the APA and APNIC teams to put this on, particularly to Yvonne Shelton, our events organizer, who's done a brilliant job with the logistics and making this event happen. Um, and so we won't be doing this again next year, but um, it's been a good experience for us, and we look forward to running into you at the next APNIC or Apricot, uh, wherever in the world it may be. Thanks for that. Thank you very much, Jordan. Okay. 
So next up, I would like to invite um, Akinori Mimura to say a few words on behalf of APNIC, our co-organizer for APRICOT 2016. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, my name is uh, Maimura Akinori uh, from JPNIC and the APNIC Executive Council. And then uh, this is a really uh, great week. It's uh, now going near to the end. But uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, say something for the Apricot APAN 2015, uh, which was held in uh, Fukuoka. Uh, was uh, actually my hometown, and I'm really proud of that. And then uh, this time I came here in uh, Auckland, uh, and uh, pretty much similar to Fukuoka in terms of the population, uh, size of the, the city, the fabulous seafood, everything is fantastic. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, uh, I, I need to uh, appreciate a lot of people. Uh, first goes to, uh, uh, goes to the uh, Internet NZ, the, uh, the general host of this Ipergot, and uh, uh, really glad to uh, have Internet NZ as a host for, the, for its own really good hospitality. Thank you very much. Then uh, uh, Apricot is uh, run by the APIA, so APIA board and the APIA uh, program committee uh, are uh, make, it, make it happen. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, of course, sponsors who helps uh, Apricot running is very really, uh, precious. Uh, a lot of people who, uh, who ran the sessions in a workshop week, conference week, uh, without, without them, uh, it's uh, apricot uh, cannot be so substantial. Then uh, we have a lot of agendas here. Uh, for example, I was impressed in the IPv6 and mobile network, and uh, IPv4 transfer market, IANA transition, and then the NOG updates, and uh, in, uh, and uh, as the APNIC, APNIC track, we had an intensive session uh, for the discussion of the FUIs. And uh, those are really, uh, I think, new thing, uh, which, uh, which, brings, uh, uh, which bring uh, us the change for the internet. And then the unchanged thing in the apricot is uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the conference center, a lot of mingle. Uh, people to people, a laugh, uh, a lot of laughter, and uh, enjoyment uh, with the community. That's unchanged, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, moving the internet. And then uh, we had the really precious experience of the evacuation. That's really, <laughs> really, really uh, the rare to experience. So uh, uh, this is a clo closing uh, uh, plenary, and then we will have the closing dinner uh, today, but uh, not really closing, uh, which is I must to emphasize, because uh, APNIC has the, its annual general meeting after, uh, on the Friday, so uh, please do stay here one, uh, one more day uh, to observe the APNIC business uh, uh, on Friday. And then we will have the APNI closing dinner. Uh, so uh, Apricot is not, not, again, Apricot is not closing today, but tomorrow with the APNI KGM. Again, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, uh, of the really big number of the 800, uh, 800 plus uh, attended, that's really great in a lovely city in Auckland. Thank you very much. Being, being very undignified here, I should probably be using the steps at the other end rather than jumping off the end of the stage here. But anyway, uh, so thank you, Akinori, for that, and thank you, Jordan, for your thanks as well. Um, my turn on behalf of APIA um, to do the, the list of thanks and share some statistics and so on from the event this week. Um, so Apricot is put together by a cast of, well, hundreds at least. Um, we have a management committee who basically oversees the production of this event, um, program committee who have worked um, since October, early November to assemble the program um, 
for, that we've seen this week. The fellowship committee, we had um, 22 fellows uh, participating in Apricot this week. Most of them actually came for the workshops, which was good to see, um, coming for training opportunities, um, and they've, most of them have already gone back home. Uh, but it's nice to see the, the fellows. We made a special effort for um, attracting fellows from the Pacific this year. Um, so the fellowship committee was working in September. Um, is this another New Zealand surprise? Or? Anyway. <laughs> Maybe it's getting towards evening and we need to finish. So, um, so the fellowship committee was working in um, September, October time um, to select the fellows that were coming to Apricot. Um, more thank yous. So we want to express a heartfelt thanks to Internet New Zealand, all the staff uh, led by Jordan, Yvonne for the team lead for pr the production of this event. I'm always given to trouble for pointing out names of people, but you know, Yvonne, you did a sterling job. We really appreciate everything you've done. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'd like to thank the APNIC Secretariat for their valuable contribution to Apricot's ongoing success. Um, we've been working together um, in the production of Apricot. Of course, as you know, APNIC was one of the founders of Apricot way back in 1996. So again, thanks to all the APNIC staff and the EC for the, the support for this Apricot. Um, also thanks to the volunteers from the local community who have been helping out in various ways throughout the event. All the sponsors and supporters, we're going to call you out in a, in a few minutes. Um, thanks to them as well. Again, without the sponsorship and the various support and kind for Apricot, we simply couldn't do this. We couldn't keep the conference registration fee as low it has been. As people point out, it's been unchanged since pretty much we started this um, 20 years ago. So that's, that's always good. And we always look for opportunities to make it as um, inexpensive for participants as possible. So, numbers. Um, so these are the latest exact numbers from, um, from Mully. Um, so what these are, registrations through the door, we had 553 as of a few minutes ago. Um, 66 workshop attendees, 53 economies were represented. Um, and the top five as an, uh, economies here, um, 108 participants from New Zealand, 94 from Australia, 58 from the US, 54 from Japan, 39 from Singapore and so on down to the individual ones from quite a few places around the region as well. Um, as for watching online, we had, um, well, the latest numbers, 1,400 YouTube views. Um, so this was, is being webcast on YouTube, and we also had 38 on Adobe Connect. I think it's pretty clear where we're going with webcast in the future. Um, YouTube seems quite popular. So those are the general numbers. Um, I think the, really the next thing we can do is move on to recognizing all the sponsors. Um, so I'll start with that. So I would like to invite um, Jordan from Internet New Zealand, if you'd please come up on the stage. And Akinori, sorry. Sorry, Akinori, if you where you got there. Yeah. If you come up, please, as well. What's that? What's that? That's that special thing. Wow. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, oops. Oops, this is not all going to work. Right, so, token appreciation from APIA and APNIC to Internet New Zealand for the hosting of Apricot. So, That one. Can't do three-way. <laughs> Don't want the three-way handshake. <laughs> All right. Those of you know what I mean. Okay. So, anyway. So, thank you very much, Jordan. Thank you. And I'll put it up to you. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, Akinor and Jordan, if you would please stay on the stage. We can give you a bag as well. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't get fingerprints all over it, so... Right, so what I'd like to do now is um, give a token of appreciation to all the sponsors. So representatives of the sponsors, if you can be ready to please come up on stage. We have a small token to uh, 
um, small token to give to you. Um, and when you come up, if you'd please just come up and stay on the stage, because we'll take a group photograph um, after that's all been done. So, first off, um, Juniper Networks, the platinum sponsor and the sponsor of our opening social. Is anybody from Juniper here? <laughs> yep, so. We really didn't think about the steps, did we? But anyway. <laughs> So if you'd stay on the stage, please. So next up, we have um, Apinic for the closing social. Can somebody from Apinic come? Um, I should mention Equinix, um, who've already left. They were the sponsor of the Peering Social on, on Tuesday. Next up, we have Hilco Stream Bank, who were the gold sponsor. Somebody from Hilco? Nobody from Hilco? Okay, we move onwards. Um, next up, we have Megaport for the Espresso Cart. That wonderful Espresso Cart. That's been the loudest applause so far, note to self. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, next up. Oops, maybe I should come here. Okay. Sorry. All right. Next up, we <laughs> it's very hard being MC as well as doing this. Next up, Affilias, who are our community sponsor. Yeah, Desiree's here. <laughs> now we've moved the stairs to the other side, so. Next, Google, another of our community sponsors. And ICANN, another of our community sponsors. Champ. You think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We now have Netflix, our other community sponsor. Next, we have the Network Startup Resource Center for community sponsorship. Thank you. 
Okay, I think we've worked out the sequence now. <laughs> now we have ISOC, a fellowship sponsor. Next, we have Japan 2015 Exco for fellowship sponsor. So next we have NZNOG for the fellowship sponsorship. Is there anybody from NZNOG here? None of the trustees? Even better. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, Chorus for sponsoring our lunches. Thank you. Vibe Communications for the network. Doesn't look like it, okay. We will give them this to them later. Vocus Communications, Silver Sponsorship and Network. Um, Adva for silver sponsorship. Nope. Okay. Um, I should mention Arbor Networks, our silver sponsor. They've already um, left. And BTI Systems, silver sponsor, who've already also gone. And Dot Asia, silver sponsor, who've already also gone. Next up, we have Brocade, silver sponsor. Curvature for silver sponsorship. No curvatures. Okay. Um, Go Wireless, silver sponsor. Nokia, a silver sponsor. <laughs> On to the bronze sponsors, JPIX. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
do it that way. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to think what now. Um, JP Knapp, bronze sponsorship. No, nobody from JP Knapp here. Okay, I'll skip that. Netka System, bronze sponsor. Nope. Okay. Those list all our sponsors. Um, so thank you all very much. I think we'll now take a group photo of all the sponsors. So I think we'll probably need to stretch out across the stage a bit. And, yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you both very much. Thank you. All right. So this brings us to really the final item of our um, closing plenary. I would like to invite Tang from Viennik to come on to stage and welcome us to Apricot 2017. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tang from uh, Vietnic. I'm a deputy director general of uh, Vietnam Internet Network Information Center. We are a non-profit organization and the ministry of uh, information and communication of Vietnam. We are the CTLD.vn uh, and NIA and uh, we also manage the uh, Vietnam Internet Exchange and we are in charge of uh, promote the uh, Internet development of Vietnam. So, uh, as uh, many of you here know about that, next uh, uh, IP code um, uh, 2017 will be in Ho Chi Minh City uh, of Vietnam. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, our honor to, to have the IP code meeting in Vietnam. It's a great, uh, great opportunity for us, for local community, to, to hold a success. Very important event uh, in uh, Vietnam. It's a great, uh, great opportunity for the local. And uh, with the open internet policy and uh, a strong initiative, we uh, have uh, a guy uh, such a uh, proud of um, uh, great result. Such that uh, we now we have uh, 42 percent of uh, internet. Um, uh, and uh, in the next five years, it will be a double. I uh, we believe about that. And Ho Chi Minh City is uh, located in the south of Vietnam, and um, it's a biggest city and the more dynamic and growing city. And uh, I will hope you, all of you will be there and enjoy all of, uh, about the, the culture, the people, the family lead, and the uh, hospitality here and. Uh, uh, definitely something you must try in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, the mixture of the old culture and the new lifestyle in Ho Chi Minh City. So uh, next, uh, in order to present you some scenery and uh, the people of Vietnamese, Vietnamese here, uh, we, the following clip is a promotion, official promotion uh, um, matter of uh, military of uh, foreign affair of uh, Vietnam. Uh, due to the time limit, so we just select just some uh, some outstanding content to present to you. So please take a look at the screen. Uh, some, some, someone in kiosk uh, help me to turn on the clips.
Welcome to Vietnam, the land of miracles. Vietnam, a country with a history that goes back thousands of years, is blessed by Mother Nature with heart-touching magnificent landscapes. With unique values of biodiversity, culture and architecture, being home to eight UNESCO recognized world natural heritages, Vietnam comes across as a top attractive tourist destination in Southeast Asia. A mystical, dreamy and elegant Ha Long Bay. An ancient and poetic Chang An landscape complex. The captivating and spectacular site of Phong Nha Khe Bang National Park. The mysterious, tranquil ancient temples and towers of Mi Son Sanctuary. The imperial citadel of Tang Long, the citadel of the Ho Dynasty, the complex of Hue monuments are relics of the glorious royal dynasties in the history of Vietnam. Come to Vietnam, immerse yourself in her natural beauties and feel the strong vitality and great development potential of our country. That's it. Um, the full clip is uh, also available on YouTube uh, for who is stressed. It's uh, about nine minutes uh, long. So, um, so finally, I uh, would like to say welcome all of you to Vietnam. Welcome to Ho Chi Minh City next year. And uh, I hope all of you will be there. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Tang. So the dates for your diary next year, um, Apricot 2017. Um, workshops take place from February 20th to the 24th. Um, that's Monday to Friday. And the conference takes place from Monday 27th through to the Friday 3rd of March. So they're already published on conference organizers' website. They're on the Apricot website already. Um, so please mark those in, the, in your diary. Um, we're working with Viennik and Netnam to host the event. We've already had many discussions with them, so we're very excited about um, bringing Apricot to Vietnam for the first time. Um, as you know, it is Apricot's mission to um, improve the internet infrastructure through education and collaboration around the uh, region. And so going to new countries, new locations for the event is top priority for us. So, um, the opportunity to go to Ho Chi Minh City is something that um, we're all very excited about. So thank you to uh, Netnam, thank you to Viennik for working with us for, to produce this event next year. Otherwise, um, that's almost all I have. We have the closing social this evening, starting in about an hour from now. So the closing reception is an NZ3 and NZ4, which is the other side of this wall. Um, starting from 6.30, running on to about 9 p.m. You're all very, very welcome. If you remember, APNIC is sponsoring that um, particular social event. Um, so please do come and join us. Otherwise, I hope you have enjoyed this whole apricot on behalf of the host, Internet New Zealand, and the joint organizers, API and APNIC. Um, thank you all very much for coming down to this part of the world. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we'll see you all in Ho Chi Minh next year. Thank you.